Well, good morning, everyone. I am really delighted to be here for any number of reasons. I am a Maya Rockymore fan, and I do hope that Sister Girl will seriously consider. I know I'm not supposed to say something. Someone told me I wasn't supposed to say something. So I guess I said something that I wasn't supposed to say. I, it kind of bees like that sometime. Um, I tell people all the time, you know, after you're over 60, you forget what people tell you. You know, I both have uh, CRS, which means can't remember spit. And then there's another one called craft. And I have you figured that out. Can't remember a thing. So, uh, but in any case, I'm sorry that Maya, I'm delighted that uh, she and Elijah are healing, but I'm sorry that she isn't here. Um, and y'all, y'all be Maya fans because she's a great sister who's doing great things with her um, work. And I think that this intersection of looking at health equity and wealth equity is extremely important. I have spent a fair amount of time, um, I'm a labor economist by training, but of course, all, there's all this intersectionality that we don't pay attention to. So we often tell people to stay in their lane, but the world does not have lanes. You know, the world is a circle, you know? The world is a ghetto, quite frankly, for so many of us. So to say stay in your lane means that you can't pay attention to the way that health and wealth work together. But I spent um, a couple of weeks, a couple years ago, actually doing a, a series of lectures at Meharry uh, University in, in Nashville at a med school. And I'm like, why did they call me to come to a med school? Well, because I'm kind of a renaissance person, but as I thought about all the data, and I'm not gonna give you the health data because you guys know the health data, but let's talk about the, act, the data of why do you have health inequities? I boil it down to what I call three A's. One is access. Where are health serving structures placed? What communities are they placed in? Uh, what kind of reputations do these places have? I was on the board of the United Medical Center in Washington, D.C. for about two years. Mayor Vince Gray appointed me to fill out somebody else's term. Mayor Bowser kicked me off. I ain't mad at her. Um, <laughs> but I know that Vince put me on there to raise hell. And so I did. And um, eh, everybody wasn't happy about it. Uh, the plan at some point was to merge UMC with Howard Hospital. Who in their right mind wants to merge two failing hospitals? Who in their right mind wants to do this? So everybody going to get messed up. Um, but in any case, you know, one of the challenges about UMC is that it has a horrible reputation. So people would say things like, I wouldn't send my dog there but it was the only hospital east of the river. So what does that say to somebody who has to have certain kinds of treatments? So access is a huge issue. Where are things located? Who gets access to them? Who has these free clinics? And who wants to only go to a free clinic? Access issues are extremely important. Assets, I'm gonna talk about a bit more, but like what is affordable? You know, so the assets piece is really important. What's affordable, you know, what, by occupation, by employment, unemployment, by savings and wealth, how many assets do you have to get to healthcare? And not only, see, right now this conversation that these fools are having on the Hill, yes, I said fools. Um, I don't think they told me I couldn't say fools. Um, <laughs> You know, they did say I couldn't call 45 the orange orangutan. Um, so I didn't. But what I would say is this. A lady wrote me a letter, and she said, Dear Dr. Malvo, please do not call 45 an orangutan, because orangutans are very nice animals. I'm like, oh, hi. But this nonsense they're doing is about health insurance, not health care. And we have to be clear about the two things. Health insurance is a bureaucratic construct. Health care is that when you're sick, you get to get care. And too many people, even with health insurance, don't get care. And there is an asset differential between who gets care and who does not. And we know about that. We know, you know that if you have money, you can get what you want like that. And if you don't, you won't. You know that some people's dogs have better health access than a whole lot of people. 
human beings. And we know that single payer is probably the best way to go, but we have not taken the time, energy, focus to deal with that. So instead you have Bubba the Fool and Homie the Clown stepping over each other, <laughs> trying to figure out how to do what they don't know how to do. We know that the Affordable Care Act is flawed, but we know it was a step in the right direction. And we know how many more people, including three million more African Americans, had access to health insurance, I didn't say health care, health insurance because of the Affordable Care Act. So we have access, we have assets, and then we have attitudes. And the attitude piece is extremely important. It's like, what do, so what do we think about health care? What does health care think about us? How are we treated when we go into environments? The Institute of Medicines did a study a decade or so ago that looked at, and we just have to extrapolate because it did look at women, but looked at black men who had broken bones, who had broken bones. And more than half of the cases, these black men who had broken bones were denied painkillers because the assumption was that they were addicts and that they wanted painkillers to sell or to do whatever with. These were people with broken bones. Now again, the studies did not look at women. And again, and that becomes another issue. Why are we so often sidelined from these studies, from these clinical trials? So why can't we figure out what's wrong with us? You know, the, the line so often was, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. But what among us has been diagnosed? Fannie Lou Hamer died from undiagnosed breast cancer and from hypertension. By the time her breast cancer was diagnosed, she had lumps in her breast that felt like stones. This was our civil rights icon who was beaten damn near to death by men who did not want her to have the right to register to vote. Beaten almost to death. She lost her vision in one eye. She did not have access to health care. She lived with it. She believed that pain was part of her legacy, that pain was what she was supposed to feel. But how many black women feel that way? Too many. Years ago, I was diagnosed with gout, which I was stunned by. I thought it was a white man's disease, a rich white man's disease. I'm like, huh? Huh? I mean, it went away eventually, but I, w I went someplace, I came back, my foot was like three times its normal size. It was drama. Uh, and anyway, a friend, mom said to me, that's happened to me three or four times. I couldn't imagine it could be gout. I said, go to the doctor. She said, well, when my foot swells up, I just put on a bigger slipper and go on about my business. Well, how, come on, y'all. Let's tell the truth. How many of y'all have done that? Have said, it's okay. I'm not sick. We take care of everybody except for ourselves. And that goes with health and with wealth. When we look at some of these numbers and some of this stuff, the sick and tired of being sick and tired really speaks to the status of African-American women uh, in our society. And I'm talking not only about physical health, but about mental health. Phyllis Hyman killed herself. She was amazing, incandescent, just so talented. I had the interesting opportunity, and it was interesting, to share a green room with her in Columbia, South Carolina in, I don't know, it was the late 90s, mid 90s, before I moved to DC. Well, she didn't like to share, and neither, frankly, do I. So we both sitting in this green room, it's like, she looking me up and down, I'm looking her up and down. I said, you know, sister, I just adore you. I think you're great. But we gonna have to share this room. <laughs> and she said, well, who are you? I said, well, you know, I'm just a sister trying to crunch some numbers. But we had a great, great time after we sort of got through that. And when I learned that she had killed herself, I wondered about who she had to talk to. I wondered about the whole, you know, we talk about health, but the two things we leave out are mental health and dental health. So we'll, we're gonna talk about, did you get your mammogram? Did you have your annual? But mental health and dental health are laid out, le left out. In the end, you know, we women, but especially we African-American women, 
We don't believe that we're weak. Girl, you need to talk to your pastor. This is what I believe. Yeah, girl, you know, but your pastor is not a clinician. Your pastor is your pastor. And some of them P-R-A-Y and some of them P-R-E-Y. So, you know, it's not clear that the pastors want to talk to. Girl, we should just go have a drink. Well, if you that cray-cray, the drink is like the last thing you need, you know? But, you know, your friends will say, well, you're not really depressed. It's just, you know, something going on. So this young sister, Karen Washington, who founded um, for Brown Girls, killed herself at 23. She was a student at Morgan State University. She was amazing. But again, where are the resources? Where is the access? And with so many of our health insurance programs, they limit what we can have. So, you know, one health insurance uh, piece that I saw from a friend allowed her 10 sessions with a mental health professional. Well, hell, it takes them 10 sessions to figure out you're crazy. <laughs> Then what you gonna do? And I don't mean crazy pejoratively, I just mean let's, let's just be clear that women, and especially women of color, are under enormous economic stress, and that this economic stress affects health issues. And so the work that must be done is a work that puts this thing together, that talks about closing the wealth gap, closing the health gap, and increasing income so people have more access. When we look at the data about income and poverty, what we know is that, of course, women of color, African-American women, are at the bottom of the totem pole. In 2015, from which we have the latest data, 21%, 22% really, of African-American women earned less than $15,000 a year. 22%. Though they're actually of all African Americans, the poverty rate, you know, 32% for children under 18. We go down and look at any number of other indicators and we find, well, Dr. King said once that of the good things that our society has, the Negro has half, and of the bad things, we have double. Now, and that wasn't his speech, where do we go from here? Now, that's not completely the case anymore, but it's close. Unemployment rate, double. Infant mortality, double. High income, half. What is this about and what can we do about it? And the big question becomes what can we do about it? Because I think that we are in a time when there is a resistance to redistribution. We are in a time of what I call predatory capitalism. Capitalists are attempting to extract every penny of surplus value from every interaction that we have. And what does that mean? It means that with health care, cutting, cutting, cutting. Planned Parenthood is not the devil. Planned Parenthood does not just provide access to abortion. They do mammograms, they do pap screening, Many of our young women, I'll tell you, I, um, as, as a college president of a women's college, encountered many young girls who were 18 and had never had their pap. We sent them to Planned Parenthood, who cut a deal with us where they were able to do stuff for a little bit less. You know, you had to have a health exam to come to college. But a lot of people, especially first generation, how many people just don't go to the doctor? don't go to the dentist. They don't go because they don't have the money and they don't think it's important. But public policy has to make sure that this is important. And even more than that, when we look at some of this stuff, what we have to look at is how much does it cost our society in the long run to cut people off in the short run? You know, what happens when in the long run people don't have preventative care? when people don't have mammograms, et cetera, when people don't have opportunities, what happens in the long run? These are people who are gonna show up in the emergency room and that's gonna be overcrowded. And we have to deal with that. And so somehow public policy can really respond to the crisis that we're experiencing 
if we can get public policy to move. And when we poll people all around the country, what do they say? Most people, regardless of their partisan affiliation, do not want to see people without health care. We have turned this into a partisan conversation about this versus that, Obamacare versus, first of all, as soon as they called it Obamacare, you know they was messing up. <laughs> you know, because Bill Maher and a number of other people did these studies. Do you like the Affordable Care Act? Yes. Do you like Obamacare? No. Same thing, fool. <laughs> <laughs> but this was really about attempting to demonize, and okay, so whoever's here for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, they gave me a script. Anybody who has ever Googled me know that I don't really do scripts that well. Um, I tried, but I just couldn't do it. But I, this is not really partisan. This is practical. We empowered more people to have health insurance, not health care. Now we're going to take it away. What does it take for us to build community health centers in most of our neighborhoods? Well, people can go and get help. You have people who are waiting months to get certain tests. They don't have to do that. We have not prioritized health for people, and especially for women. And we women, y'all, are all too eager to suck it up and swallow it and say, well, I really don't feel that bad. I have had friends, I'm 63, I'm proud to say that because I've started so much mess with so many people that I don't have to be here. Um, you know, I mean, I really don't have to be here. Praise the Lord, I am. But um, some of y'all who know me, I've, I've started enough mess with enough people. Um, but in any case, having said, but I have had every month in the past year, I've had a friend die. Some of them have been younger than me. Some of them have been a couple of years older. None of them have been elders in the people that I'm counting. But these are women who didn't get their breast cancer diagnosed soon enough. And by the time they caught it, it was time to go. These were sisters who were obese and didn't think, you know, I have one friend, girlfriend did not believe in leftovers. So she cooked something every day. Every single day she cooked something new. I'm like, girly. Your husband left, you don't have to cook no more. <laughs> Go get you a salad at Subway or something. You know, but anytime you went out, she had new food. And she had a heart attack, you know, and she was 62 when she passed. She's my college roommate. And I could call the role, and what I can see in the role that I call is that many of these folks just did not pay attention to themselves. The other thing that I can see is that so many people have the resources to do, and so many people don't have the resources to do. So you have folks, I have a good friend who just retired, and she has a yoga instructor come to her house three days a week. I'm like, good for you. But Tamika and Tawana not only don't have someone to come to them, but may not have a yoga place to go to. So when we're paying attention to what's going on, we need to pay attention to who has access. Again, it's access, assets, and attitudes. And let me take a couple minutes to talk about the attitudes because I think they're really important. Oftentimes, we go to get health care and we get attitude. We get people who make assumptions about who we are and what's wrong with us. I went someplace now, you know, I'm not, I'm not rich, but I make a reasonable income. And the, excuse my language, heifer, at the front desk said, do you have your Medicaid card? She did not say, do you have your health insurance card? And I was relatively well dressed that day. Now, I know when I, you know, if I got my sweats on and my hat backwards, I could pass for a serious homie. But uh, why would you assume even a serious homie might have a health insurance card? Girlie said, do you, where is your bed? Oh, I turned that place out. I hollered the screen, oh, what the F is wrong with you? Have you lost your whole mind? This was a really great introduction to the doctor, you know. Uh, actually, I didn't see it, but I said, I go someplace else. It wasn't that deep. But how many of us get that? 
how many women who are overweight get the assumption that they're overweight is a function of carelessness or laxness, not something else. Plus, some of the height and weight charts are weird. You know, I mean, my body mass index is 24.5, which means 25 is like you're fat. Everybody in my family is like, can you gain some weight? Because I, I lost a bunch of weight. I lost about 20 pounds at a point in time, deliberately. But my, my brother comes up to me, don't nobody like a bone but a dog. <laughs> 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 you know, because <laughs> I don't pay my brother any attention, but anyway, but the man he was trying to introduce me to was kind of fine. Uh, <laughs> so I was like, but I'm happy with my size. How many of us get that kind of stuff? And this is the attitude. And then what kind of attitudes do we have because we know we have not been treated well? We know that women have been sterilized in the 70s. Okay, well, I don't know about all that. You have to share that with me. But we know that women have been sterilized because the doctor felt they had too many children. In North Carolina, there's a whole thing that goes back to the 1930s and 40s where if you were, if you were assumed to be mentally ill, you could be sterilized. Assumed by whose assumption? They thought you were mentally ill if you wouldn't serve in the military or if you wouldn't be somebody's maid. So people were just sterilized. So there is a mistrust between people of color and the medical institutions. And what we also see here, which is also frightening, is the declining number of African-American women, other women of color are rising a little bit, African-American women who are getting MD degrees. And so it's not that you have to have somebody who looks like you to provide medical services, but somehow you want to feel comfortable. And if you don't feel comfortable, you're not gonna go. You know, and that's real and it's frightening when we look at what goes on. And then the changing nature of health care, health insurance, has been such that co-pays have racketed up. So where you once paid five or ten, now you may be paying 20, 40, 50. And again, this becomes a discretionary decision. Do I need to go to the doctor and pay $40, or does my child need shoes? And that comes out. And so we, black women especially, but women of color generally, avoid taking care of ourselves because we prefer to take care of others. So when we begin to unpack all this and figure out what's going on, part of what we need to figure out is what policy ideas we can put on the table to see how we can close these gaps. The wealth gap, many have written about extensively. I don't think we're ever going to close that gap unless we do clear asset transfers to those who don't have assets. For those who don't know what I'm saying, I'm talking about an acceptable form of reparations. You cannot close a gap by going where you're going while doing what you're doing unless you say we're going to put some exogenous amount of dollars into these people's lives. Now, I, I know that, you know, white America is not going to do reparations. I'm clear. Um, but I also know that there are ways that this can be worded to talk about certain census tracts and certain people to say these folks deserve a boost. But the other piece of it really is the health equity gap. And if you go into certain neighborhoods and you don't see a clinic, you don't see a hospital, that tells you what to do. It says let these people in. Provide them with opportunities. It says that people who say they're progressive, and there are a lot of people who say they're progressive. And I find that very cute. Uh, because what does that mean and how does it translate? So if you're in a city where you know a neighborhood does not have access, what you going to do about it? Can we build? Can we provide transportation? Can we provide vouchers? Can we say this is a matter of concern? Because when we look at a bunch of data, we find some very frightening things. As an example, when we look at incarceration, 
we find that the incarceration rate for African American women has increased by 800 percent, 800 percent in a 20-year period. And we also find that half of those women are mothers, that some of them have given birth in jail with their legs shackled apart as they're going to give birth, with their arms shackled. That must be, I mean, I had no kids, praise the Lord. Um, someone asked me one time, how could you be 60 and fine and never married? I said, I worked at it. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I truly worked at it. I'm like, yo, bro, <laughs> you know. You can get the two-year contract, but you can't stay. Uh, <laughs> but so having not been able to experience that, I just, when I think about the way that mothers in prison are treated, and then what happens to their children, and what kind of services they get, including mental health services. And this is something we totally, totally, completely, and utterly ignore. Why? Because we can. Because we can. And then 15 years later, when homie comes slinging and mad, oh, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. Footnote, I don't want to hear anybody in their lifetime say anything to me about black-on-black -black crime until they talk about that crazy man who shot up that Republican baseball game as white-on-white -white crime. You know, have you ever been doing that white-on-white -white crime? But that's what it was. And that's what most violence is, is intra-racial. It's not, you know, folks are not going from the hood to the suburbs just to commit some crimes. I mean, they have to pay Metro to do that. And <laughs> why? Okay. My horrible sense of humor gets me in trouble yes, yet again, um, <laughs> which I've always told. It's like uh, somebody told me, if you could just watch your mouth. You could be the president of the United States. I said, I wouldn't want to be the president of the United States, so I ain't going to watch your mouth. Uh, <laughs> but in any case, sisters and brothers, when we talk about wealth and health, three things we have to remember. Number one, they are intertwined, inextricably intertwined. People will not be healthy if they don't have access to resources. People will not be healthy if they don't have access to health care structures. And people will not be healthy if we cannot overcome the racist attitudes that allow doctors to judge people who come for help. And then internally, we have to believe, sisters, that we're worth it. We have to believe that we're worth having the best care there is, that we're willing to fight for it, that we're willing to deal with allies around it, that when we are treated in a disparaging way, we are willing to raise our voices. So many hospitals are connected to the public enterprise. They're getting subsidies one way or another from the city, the county, the feds. We cannot allow people who take our tax money to disrespect us. Simply can't do it. And so we have to begin to coalesce, I ain't lobbying, Robert Wood Johnson, I ain't lobbying, for the record. But we have to coalesce around what we think we deserve in terms of not health insurance, but health care. They are two different things. We certainly want health insurance, but we must also have health care. And that starts from zero until we pass, which means the dental care piece is so important. We have so many young mothers who um, are feeding their babies juice. Juice will erode teeth. Or Coca-Cola. Those things erode teeth. But there needs to be an education about what should be shared and what can be fed. We have, when I talk about access to health care, I'm also talking about access to healthy food. Too many people of color live in food deserts. Where it's more, you can more likely find, you know, um, I don't know, I mean, the bananas are aging. And you go into some of those stores sometimes, you just kind of cringe. And it, but if that's the closest thing you can walk to, this becomes a problem. The intersectionality is about dealing with income issues, but also dealing with health issues, and dealing with them at the same time. Women who are poor, people who live below the poverty line, do not have the same 
access as middle income women do. The question at the end of the day is what are we gonna do about it? Again, your takeaways for me, access, assets, and attitudes. Access, assets, and attitudes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I believe I have the opportunity to respond to a couple of questions or comments. As somebody is in charge here, not me. Uh, okay, thank you. Y'all don't have any. <laughs> I want to thank you for your inspiring words. I think as um, I, I was hoping to get your reflection on this because as I, I think about uh, what we have to do to build wealth and achieve greater health equity, it also for me is about how we're disrupting those economies that exist in our oppression, right? So we have in um, California's Central Valley the highest density of prisons anywhere throughout the state. Um, we also have, um, you know, a system, a food system that is really about um, creating poor health in our communities, right? So it's, it's draining wealth and health from the people who are picking the fruits and vegetables, but as well, um, it is creating uh, just a, an exploitive in, uh, environment for our natural environment, right? Like, so the water is being taken to create soda. So I, I think about all of these things that are affecting our health and that are um, industries profiting off of that and that we must also be disruptive to those forces as we're creating these new economies that are helpful to us. So I wonder if you have any reflections in relation to those actions and activities that we have to take. Hmm. I think one thing that you just said which, which struck me when you talk about water being turned into soda is well, I think we always have to look at, my thing as an economist is follow the money. You know, who's making money off other people's pain? Who's making money off, you know, we can look at the prison industrial complex, which is essentially crazy. Uh, just um, about a month ago, the Federal Communications Commission declined to fight a rule they put out, a rule they put out that said you could not charge more than 25 cents a minute for prison phone calls. And the FCC under the new administration has said, we, we don't, we're not down with that. They can charge whatever they want. Now, because the uh, expectation is 25 cents for federal prisons, we think that'll stay, but the issue was for state and local prisons where people spend as much as $10 a minute. And we know that recidivism is connected with family contact. People who have more family contact tend not to go back to jail. So always with the question you raised, especially in the Central Valley, the issue is both to follow the money. And I see also in the Central Valley, I'm, I'm a native San Franciscan. Um, I think also one of the things you have to look at is how people are being diverted once they're incarcerated. Are they being sent back to the same fields they came from as, as, as contract labor? So I, I, I'd love to talk to you for a few minutes. I don't think I got all the nuances of your question, but I do think that my answer to all of this is follow money. Good morning. Hi. Oh, uh, hi. hi. I have a question. I'm going to assume that um, based on some of what you shared that you might agree with this, and this is regarding the emotional and mental health of women, um, indigenous and minority women, specifically in African uh, in, in the US, but the imperative for us to help them develop self-confidence so that we have um, agency in making our own decisions. And not only so that we can go into workplaces healthy and take care of our families healthy, but so that we can create our own, our own incomes you know, making decisions to be, you know, to create food cooperatives in our cities or to have urban farms so that we can take care of ourselves and be self-sufficient. Or even when our leadership says, you know, that uh, two-parent households are the best households, 
but we're a single parent and we decide to continue to stay a single parent because we can raise healthy and whole children that way rather than going into a relationship that might continue to perpetuate um, unhealthy behaviors in our household. So can you speak to the imperative of um, creating agency, uh, recognizing agency for um, indigenous and um, w women in general in the U.S.? Um, what policies and you know things need to go for to make sure that that happens and is possibly on the forefront if you think it's that important. Thank hey, you. Great question. Thank you. Um, I always, you know, I'm uh, the oldest of five children. My parents got divorced when I was six. My mama raised a PhD, two MBAs, a lawyer, and I got this brother we call him Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Um, <laughs> you don't ask me nothing about it, I ain't gonna tell you. <laughs> but. But basically, I mean, he's as bright as anybody else. He had a construction business, but he's after me. So he likes to have sibling rivalry. So if I did it, he didn't. The day that I ran for public office in San Francisco, um, my brother was arrested for public urination around the country, around the corner, so that the lovely article that said Julianne Malvo was running for city council said, her brother James. And I'm like, why did you do that? He said, just to irritate you. But, uh, and he did. But anyway... I, I think it's unfair and unreasonable for people to repudiate single moms who are doing the best that they can. Yeah. And I was raised by one, and um, you know, I ain't no scrub. So, uh, you know, I think that what has happened is that while we have relaxed norms, we still have a lot of the judgment. Um, and so your people will talk the talk, for example, about GBLTQ equality, but judge the child who has two mommies when she comes to school. Uh, people will talk the talk about, um, as you say, agency, but then judge people in terms of what they provide and what they don't. Our job, really, for young'uns, is to make sure that they understand that whoever and whatever they are, they are enough. That they are, that's, that's my mantra to young people. You are enough. You don't have to cut and paste yourself. You don't have to try to kowtow to somebody else's expectations. You are simply enough. And I think that it means a lot more parental involvement in schools, a lot more uh, diligence around the places where young people interact, a lot more attention paid to bullying. And it also means that we as woke, woke women of color, have to monitor our own interactions because young people model what they do based on what they see. And so, you know, I always, in a place like this, and I know this is probably isn't there, I always look for young people. Mm -hmm. well, so who brought like a 16 year old? Mm -hmm. You know, just brought her because she could experience some of this and see some of the uplift that's going on. Um, Mental health issues, and we talk about agency, we really talk about, as you said, confidence, uh, foundation. Women of color, and black women especially, are sitting at the bottom of the totem pole and get cut, slashed, day by day. Mm -hmm. What has just happened with Venus Williams, as an example, is an absurdity. The police said she was not at fault, but she has endured just hate. You know, she killed a white man. No, she didn't kill the white man. The white man died. But this is a woman who has been an icon. But this is, I mean, Susan Rice, last administration, but they want to bring her back and dig her in. And we can go down the road and down the road and down the road. And so while some of this is policy in terms of access to mental health, some of it is also non-policy in terms of how we choose construct our communities to support each other, to let everybody know that she's okay and she's enough. And we inside ourselves have so much crap. We still do the light skin, dark skin thing. Yeah, we still real. do the straight and nappy thing, it's real. you know. Why? Why? In a, in a predatory capitalist society that will always marginalize us, the best we can do is lift up each other. Hi, my name is Lenore Hammett, and I am a former wealth manager. 
I worked for a Fortune 500 company, and out of 10,000 financial advisors who owned their own franchises, there were only 10 black women. Unfortunately, I got sick. I'm no longer with that company, but I want to talk about wealth strategies, self-sufficiency, and this massive transfer of assets that are going on. I see it in the white community, but I don't see black women preparing their children, their families to transfer the wealth. Can you talk about that? Great question, a great thing to put on the table because you're absolutely right. You know, <laughs> black folks don't think we're going to die. I mean, we think we're going to be here forever. So, I mean, part of the challenge is that I think that one of the most challenging things, and I've done a bunch of blogs for people like AARP and others around these issues, we don't know how to have a conversation with our elders about what they want. It's not only about transfer of wealth and property, but it's also about health. You know, do you have a, you know, DNR? Do you do not resuscitate or any of those things? These are, we have such um, culturally um, respect for our elders that we don't want to raise some of these questions. And so this becomes a challenge. But there is a group of African Americans who are better off than their mothers and fathers, who, baby boomers, who have accumulated and who really do need to begin to talk about what do I want to do with all my stuff? You can't spend it all. You, do you want to put it in trust for your kids? You want to just let them have it? Not if they trifling. Um, you know, one of my nephews looked at a painting I have in my house and he said, Aunt Julian, I saw that painting. It costs a lot of money. Are we rich? I said, no, Negro, we ain't rich. I said, this is my painting, which I can't spend. So I ain't even rich. I said, but don't be looking at my stuff. <laughs> Like, say, brother man, if he get anything, he gonna get it when he's 50. Because <laughs> he trifling. Um, but the, the real issue is how we begin to transfer and how we begin to have these conversations. And I think it's, it's very much a very sensitive topic for a lot of African American women. In particular, I think Latinas as well have the same kind of barriers with our much, with our great um, respect for aging. We don't necessarily want to put our elders on the spot. And yet we know that if they die intestate, who's going to get it? Right. Sam. And we, they wouldn't have given Sam a quarter that they didn't have to give, if, you know, <laughs> willingly. So it's a very gentle process of, of leading them along. Um, I think also when we talk about wealth, I think that um, we have to be clear about how much we can empower, but also how much we will enable. Empower, good, enable, not so good. So, you know, as I said, Brother Anye, you think that pain costs a lot of money? You ain't getting it. Um, Brother Man is a comedian. I love him dearly, but I tell him his occupation is dollar for dollar. Because the first of the month, he does, you know, yo, can you hook me up? No, nah, dude, you're 33. Um, <laughs> but we have to have, these, that's a set of conversations. I, I also think it's important as we look at our health and wealth. Some people have transferred assets to their children without making their wishes clear. And then they find themselves near destitute in an old folks home they wouldn't want to be in because children would not ride or die. Children would try for them. So it, the whole, this chapter for women, this chapter of passing milestones is also a chapter for self-reflection and a chapter to talk about where we go from here. Anybody else? I'm gonna hang around a little bit, so if anybody wants to talk to me, I'll be hanging around a little bit. <laughs> Thank you all so much.